Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Road to Reformation, part one of th what will eventually be three parts in our continuing study of the history of Christianity. In our timeline, we've noted the ancient, the medieval, and the Reformed Church. We've already gone through the Middle Ages. We're in the High Middle Ages, but we're going to be moving toward the Late Middle Ages, uh, and we've divided Middle Ages into those three sort of bite-sized chunks so that we can have a better look at them. During that period, still during the, the early Middle Ages, we'd had Pope Formosus, who had been elected to the papacy in 891. The Duchess Agiltrude seeks to place her son in his place as the new pope, and she actually takes his corpse and puts it on trial at what was the called the Cavender uh, I'm sorry, the cadaver synod, synod uh, taking, uh, pulling him up from the ground, of course he's dead, uh, excommunicating the Pope so that she can have her son put in his place. You have the example of Mariosia, the Roman noblewoman who becomes mistress to Pope Sergius III. Her son would become Pope John XI, uh, and he gave her the title of Patricia of Rome, that is the mother of Rome, two of her grandsons would go on to become pope. So we see uh, not every pope is, is of this caliber, but a number of situations where there were people serving as pope who had no business being seen as a spiritual leader of any sort. One of her one of her grandsons would be Pope John the Twelfth. Another would be Pope Benedict the Seventh. We move forward now to Pope Benedict the Ninth. He becomes Pope in 1032, uh, a descendant of that same family of Mariosia. Uh, his father purchased the papacy for him when he he was in his twenties. His manner of life by all accounts, was a social scandal, uh, engaging in acts of involving homosexuality, bestiology, orgies, uh, just every sort of depravity uh, he would make that papal office known for. He actually sold his office to his godfather. He wanted to, to raise money and then changed his mind and thought to take back the office. Uh, excommunicated in 1049. It's during this period, this time of upheaval, when the papacy and the leader of the church was, was sort of up for grabs, that we have both Francis of Assisi, we've seen him in an earlier class, but a contemporary in the person of Peter Waldo. Now, Peter Waldo, and, and also remember, not everybody uses that, that letter W, so you might have heard it as Peter Waldo, same person. He's a wealthy merchant of Lyons in Gaul, modern-day France, who gave away his possessions to live a life of poverty. He had parts of the Bible translated into French, or what passed for French back in, in that era. Remember, languages continue to be changing, uh, even as we've seen the English language change over history. He taught that the New Testament was to be the only rule of life for Christians. And in a day and an age where where authority was coming down from the Pope, whether he was a good leader or whether he was a bad leader, this was considered revolutionary. Waldo ended up sending out street preachers who embraced his lifestyle of poverty. So instead of, um, now remember, by contrast, you have the Pope living in a grand palace, uh, being treated as though he was an emperor, actually claiming for himself um, uh, the sort of, of prerogatives that would belong to the emperor based upon the the uh, donation of Constantine and saying uh, that the emperors wanted this to happen, so therefore they were embracing that. By contrast, here we have Waldo living a life of poverty and sending out disciples of poverty, uh, emphasizing teachings like the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Waldensians, uh, his followers, are going to come into conflict with the very rich excesses of the church. Uh, and, and people are going to look at them and say, gee, uh, he looks a little bit more like Jesus than the Pope does, who is supposed to be representing Jesus. The Waldensians were eventually declared to be a heresy, 
and driven underground, but we're still going to see Waldensians still there, still following uh, th those teachings by the time we get to the Reformation. We noted that he trans. oh, maybe we didn't notice, he, he translates scripture, at least portions of scripture, into the common language uh, because not all of his followers could read. They would memorize these sections uh, so they would become, in a sense, walking Bibles, uh, quoting parts, especially from the Sermon on the Mount, as well as other portions of the Bible. Uh, they refuse to fight in the Crusades as they adopt pacifism. Now you say, well, that reminds me of, of Francis of Assisi. Well, Francis himself was not fighting, but Francis was not arguing against those who were, even though he goes on his pilgrimage of nonviolence. He still believes in the cause of the Crusades. Peter Waldo and his followers, uh, not so much. They are actually saying, no, uh, Jesus didn't tell us to go fight enemies. He told us to forgive those who, who strike us and who, who speak and or act against us. Uh, as I said, the Waldensians, they're going to embrace the Reformation when it finally uh, emerges. They'll become part of that, but they will have been, uh, in the true sense of the word, pre-reformers before the Re Reformation ever arrives. The Council of Toulouse uh, says that we, for, we prohibit also that the laity should permitted, be permitted to have the books of the Old and the New Testament unless anyone from the motives of devotion should wish to have the Psalter or the Breviary for Divine Offices or the Hours of the Blessed Virgin, but we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. Notice this church council said, we do not want our people to have the Bible. Now, a priest can have the Bible, a bishop can have the Bible, but not regular people because who knows what they will do with it. Well, they might do something like Peter Waldo did. They might start living like Jesus. They might start uh, recognizing that some of the teachings of the church had departed, had long since departed, from the scriptures. By the way, this reminds me, and I'll probably share the story again later on, uh, my mother, who was brought up Roman Catholic, very stringent, um, and she related to me about having been told by the priest in her day, uh, and, and she wasn't nearly so old as to, to go back to, to the Council of Toulouse, but uh, she remarked about how the Roman Catholic uh, priests in her day would say, whatever you do, don't read the Bible, because if you read the Bible, you'll end up believing something other than what the church believes. And, and lo and behold, she found out that that was actually quite true. She, when she read the Bible, she came to believe some other things other than what the church was teaching. We have the advent of the Inquisition, the Episcopal Inquisition, beginning in 1184, and the bishops here were required to investigate, inquire, that's hence the, the term, to investigate their churches, uh, largely ineffective, um, because after all, the, they're giving it sort of a surface uh, look, and most bishops are saying, yeah, my church is fine. Uh, now, a papal inquisition began about 50 years later in the, in the 1230s, and this time the Dominicans, that brand new order who had just come about uh, in the last couple of decades, uh, the D Dominicans are used, and they kept written records of their inquiries. So this was not just a cursory uh, inquiring, but this was much more detailed. Heretics were giving, given a lenient penance if they denounced others. So the way you would survive if you were considered to be a heretic, you would, you would uh, report others and then you might yourself might be released or at least released with a fairly large, you know, light sentence. Uh, these were secret trials, or at least many of them were, even though the written records were kept, uh, so that you could be pulled in and charged and not even necessarily told that for which you were being charged. Why? Because it was a secret. And so the suspects were not told of the charges against them. Confess. Well, what am I supposed to confess to? You know what you did. Uh, confess. And uh, torture was allowed as of 1252. Now, you say, well, that's, that's bizarre. Well, remember that this is mirroring the 
the regular court procedures of that day. So this was part of the normal procedure. It wasn't something that was, was out of the ordinary. Um, and, but confession of, under torture was not legally admissible. And so once you, could, once you confess, then the torture would stop, and now you have to confess without being tortured. Of course, if now you change your mind, now you say you don't want to confess, then we can go back and torture again. Uh, so I'm not sure how effective any of this really was. Pope Celestine V, he's Pope in 1294. The papal office up to his point had been vacant for two years, and a Benedictine hermit, hermit by the name of Pietro Angelario wrote a letter of rebuke to the College of Cardinals. How dare you not have somebody as the Pope? Well, you know, what's wrong with you? And they took the letter and they said, well, let's make him Pope. And they elected him as Pope. Who, and he changes his name now to Celestine the, the Fifth. Remember, he, he did not want the office. He didn't have a background in church government. And so he's largely ineffective. It's a matter of taking somebody who's never had any any investment, any time that he spent in church leadership, in the politics, and remember, being a pope was a political office, and thrusting him. What happens when you take a non-politician and you, you, you elect him to the highest uh, office of the land? Well, there's going to be some, some differences and some changes. And after a while, Pope Celestine, the new Pope Celestine, says, um, I don't really want to be Pope anymore. Uh, I'm finding it a very unspiritual situation. Um, it reminds me of somebody who said, you can, you can um, make your living or you can have spirituality uh, from the church, but you, when you do try to do both, you run in danger of losing one or the other. Uh, and likewise, uh, so he abdicates, he steps down from the position. And he's going to be succeeded by Pope Boniface VIII. Now, Pope Boniface VIII, remember his successor, has just said that being a pope is an un unspiritual sort of thing, and has said that he didn't want it. The first thing he does, he has Pope Celestine, his, his predecessor, imprisoned. Uh, perhaps he's worried he might come back and retake the church office. Uh, he now, Boniface is going to declare obedience to the Pope to be essential to salvation. If you want to be saved, the way to salvation is to be obedient to the Pope. And, of course, he's the Pope. And he's going to find himself in, in conflict with Philip IV of France. Uh, and so this results in a economic blockade against Rome. So this is, uh, remember, one, one governmental leader to another, not another church leader, because the, the, the pope was sort of both. He was both church and government leader. And so um, Boniface issues the unum sanctum that says the, the popes are able to judge the suitability of kings. And this is what we've seen all along, this contest of wills. Who will have authority? Is the pope over the king? Is the king over the pope? They had already settled this in the eastern church, but now it's up for grabs in the western church. Boniface, after he has issued this unum sanctum, he is accused of heresy, of murder, of sodomy, of devil worship, and I'm not saying that he was necessarily guilty of any of these things, but there had been enough past history of seeing popes that were guilty of a number of these sorts of things where the charge is now stuck. Therefore, Boniface was arrested, he was imprisoned, he was released after a couple of days, but he died from his mistreatment a few weeks later. It had caught up with him. Now, we just said that this was an issue between the Pope or between the King of France and the Pope that has been up to this time based in Rome. After all, his official title is the Bishop of Rome. But now a new Pope is chosen who is invited to come and stay at the Papal Palace in Avignon in southern France. And he's given uh, a grand place, much nicer than, than the... Uh, the church in Rome was. Now you say, well, wait a minute, I've been to St. Peter's in Rome, it's a very nice place. It, that hadn't been built yet. And so 
uh, Rome was rather run down at this point, and Avignon, by contrast, was filled with all of the modern amenities. And so the Pope stays here, and when it comes time to, to uh, have a new Pope elected, after all, the cardinals are here in Avignon, and the previous Pope was at, at, in Avignon. So again, a, another French Pope is elected from Avignon, and he's going to stay in Avignon. Both he and his successor and the next successor, and we're going to have a whole succession of Popes that, that have never been to Rome, <laughs> that, uh, that are not, even though they have the title of Bishop of Rome, they're not in Rome, they're in Avignon. And so we have the, what, what a later individual, it might have been Martin Luther, I forget who coined it first, but someone coined this, this time the Babylonian captivity, uh, not because it's in Babylon, but the Babylonian captivity of the church, that is the, the papacy for about 70 years. Remember how the Babylonian captivity was 70 years, uh, depending on how you counted it. So likewise, this is about 70 years where the, the papal office is to be found, all the popes are, are holding office from Rome, and they're all French. Now, you've, you eventually have a break from that. An Italian pope uh, is finally elected, and he wants to reform the church because things have been getting very lax. Uh, and so uh, the French decide, well, wait a minute, we don't want reform. And so um, they'd had a whole succession of French popes, but now they have one Italian. And so they choose their own pope, uh, and you're going to have the breakup. You know, how do we choose things like popes? How do we choose things? And this is going to eventually lead to what is called the conciliar movement. Not that they are being reconciled, but, but the movement of church councils being that which guides and directs the church. You see, we'd had a study in church councils going all the way back to one in the New, Te New Testament. Acts chapter 15 had been a church council, and then we'd had the council of Nicaea and places like Ephesus and Constantinople and, and other places where we'd, and Chalcedon, where we had had church councils. And so now the question is, can we go back and do councils? Not that we're going to replace the Pope, but maybe we've been giving the Pope too much authority. Now, following the Babylonian captivity, as we said, you know, the, the French choose their own pope and the Italians have a pope. And so now we have two popes and we're going to have a period here in, up into the 1400s where we have two popes. And finally, the idea comes, well, maybe we could actually uh, have both of them step down and we'll have a replacement. And so they agree to this replacement, a, a third pope, uh, and the other two popes decide, well, we don't want to step down. And so we've gone not from two to one, but from two to three popes. <laughs> and we have three as we get into the uh, 1400s. In fact, in fact we're going to uh, attend a council uh, that will seek to rectify this and change this. The Council of Constance came to an agreement that the councils hold authority. Of course, councils are going to do that. Uh, and they elect Pope Martin, but he, uh, at the end of the day, won't sign it. He d does not agree. Uh, later on, that conciliatory movement uh, elect an anti-pope, but nobody wants to go to back to having two or three popes. That's not going to uh, win too much support. And Pope Martin reaches out to uh, the kings of the surrounding nations and says, look, um, you have want, you know, we've had this big issue in the past of want you wanting to uh, be able to appoint bishops. I'll let you do that, <laughs> provided that you agree that the Pope is the one who is making all the final decisions. And the kings are more than willing to do that. And so we have the conciliatory movement which uh, the whole idea of councils, that moves now to the back and the Pope uh, comes out stronger than ever as we approach the Reformation. It's going to be not councils, but the Pope that is the final authority. So we've had the, what well, we have, the, the Black Plague. We need, we'll speak about that, uh, a plague that comes over Europe uh, beginning in 1347, had originated in China and had gradually made its way uh, past the Black Sea and then to a ship uh, landing in, in Sicily. And uh, over the next five years, 
you had a quarter of the population of Europe die. And this was no small thing. This is now the population had already begun to decrease because they'd had a, a famine uh, in the early uh, early 1300s. But now 1347, this kicks into high gear, and we're going to see a, a great decrease in the overall population. And it's around this time that we have the ministry of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, he has been described as the morning star of the Reformation. We don't know exactly when he was born, died in 1384. He studied theology at Oxford and made a distinction between temporal rule versus spiritual rule. Now, remember that the the popes saw themselves as both spiritual and physical political, governmental leaders. They, uh, they made no distinction, and, and Wycliffe says, no, there is a difference, that those in the church are called to be spiritual rulers, and then uh, there are also governmental kings and governors and things like that that we ought to obey, but they do not have spiritual authority over us. Uh, he taught that no one in a state of mortal sin can serve as a priest. So, that therefore, uh, your ability to lead in the church should be reckoned by the kind of life that you live. Now, again, this seems rather obvious to us today when we see the history of uh, some of the papacy and other le- leaders in the church. This was considered quite revolutionary. He taught that scriptures are to be our highest authority. In a time where we'd been uh, having issues, is the Pope the highest authority? Is the church council the highest authority? Wycliffe says none of the above. It is to be the scriptures. And therefore, he seeks to translate the Vulgate into English. Now, notice he's not going back to the Greek and Hebrew. He he couldn't read either Greek or Hebrew, but he can read Latin. And so he's taking the Latin Vulgate and translating it into the language of the people of his day. Now, you have the Latin Vulgate, for example, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and I'm not going to try to read the Latin, the Desere um, Pinatentium. Um, I probably thoroughly mispronounced that because I, I don't read Latin. I, I've studied some Greek and Hebrew, but Latin is about outside of my area of expertise. But uh, translated, uh, do penance, whereas if we were to read it correctly, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 talks about repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It doesn't say anything about penance. That was probably a poor translation. Likewise, Luke chapter 1, verse 28, when uh, uh, he uh, spe- when is describing Mary, uh, have gratia pelena, uh, Mary full of grace, uh, whereas the Greek there, uh, the angel actually comes and says, uh, Mary, O oh, favored one, one who is has been given grace. You know, when when it sounds like she's full of grace, that sounds like something she did. When it talks about one who has been graced, who has been favored, that's something that God did on her behalf. Quite a difference. In the Vulgate, uh, it speaks in Ephesians chapter five, verses thirty-one and thirty-two of marriage, the sacramentum hoc. Magnum est, this sacrament is great. Uh, the Greek term doesn't use any word of sacrament. Uh, it says, uh, to mysterion, uh, to to mega est, in this mystery, you can actually hear that word mysterion, it's the word mystery. This mystery is great. Uh, it's not speaking of making marriage a sacrament. It's saying that there's something special in marriage that pictures something quite mysterious. It pictures our relationship with Jesus. Now, Wycliffe uh, insisted that there was no biblical sanction for the papacy. He wasn't speaking against any one particular pope, just the system of having a pope, of monasteries. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about having monasteries, of prayers for the dead. His followers were known as lollards. It was not a, um, it was not a compliment. Uh, they probably didn't invent that term for themselves. The idea was that they were 
poor priests. And you could take that in, in two ways. Uh, one, that they had embraced a lifestyle of poverty, but also that, uh, that their detractors did not think they were doing a very good job of being priests. Now, Wycliffe, the church actually sought to put him on trial while he was still alive, and his, his school would hear none of it. They actually dismissed it. But then after the fact, at the Council of Constance, he was declared to be a heretic. Of course, he'd been dead for um, a good 30, 40 years by now. But his bones were exhumed, and they were burned. You can't really burn him at the stake, but you could burn his bones. And the ashes were thrown into the Thames River, and somebody noted from there, they swept out to sea, where they went all throughout the world, and did eventually, as did his gospel. And so we have the story of John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. Of course, we're going to have the great schism. Um, the papacy will uh, be thrown into confusion uh, with this split, you know, not one, but two, and then three popes. And then the church will come back with a vengeance. And when it does, it will be seeking to speak, not to Wycliffe, because he's already dead, buried, dug up, but also to one of his spiritual heirs. We'll see him next time. John Huss.